tongues. Amen. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 14 tonight. Luke chapter 14. I'm going to read uh, uh, all of the passage uh, dealing, of course, with this subject, but just going to focus in on a couple of verses. So just for the sake of context, I guess, uh, we're going to uh, take a couple of verses here and make an application to our lives. And I want to preach a message tonight titled, Choosing Your Battles Wisely. Choosing Your Battles Wisely. And so we're in Luke chapter 14. If you're there, let's stand together if you're able to. We'll just read some scripture, Luke 14. And verse number 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king goeth to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. And let's pray. Father, thank you for a good spirit in the service tonight, good singing, a good choice of songs. Bless my heart. Uh, lots to say amen to through the song service. And now, Lord, we've come to the preaching of your word. And God, I pray that we would take this application. Lord, you, you, you pointed out a couple of earthly things to teach a principle. And I pray that we would learn from it tonight and we would apply it to our hearts and lives. I pray, God, that you would feel the listener as well as the preacher. Lord, I pray that you would bind the wicked one who would seek to steal the seed of your word from bearing fruit in our life. And I pray, God, that we would take what we've learnt today and we'll take it into this week and make application. Lord, we pray for the invites that are going to go out this week. We pray by faith, believing, Lord, that we will see a result of people coming to church on Sunday that uh, perhaps have never even heard the gospel. And, Lord, that they would have opportunity to be saved. So, God, we commit that to you and we commit our time now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You'd have to agree that this passage of scripture dealing with discipleship is pretty explicit. Uh, Jesus is someone as a preacher who really when he taught or when he preached, uh, not, that he, uh, not that he didn't care about the feelings of others, but he simply just says it as it is. Uh, if you're not, he says in verse number 26, if you want to come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And we know that when Jesus uses the term hate there, he is saying this, you need to love me more than those things. Amen. All right. And true discipleship is about loving Jesus more than loving the things of life. There is a difference between being a Christian and being a disciple. You can be a Christian but not a disciple. Not everybody who is a Christian is a disciple of the Lord because not everybody is willing to sacrifice like the Lord expects his disciples to sacrifice when we're going to follow him. Because in the lives of people, uh, mothers and fathers and wives and children and brothers and sisters are more important in the life of some Christians than actually being a disciple of the Lord. And so a lot of people are quite happy just and content to uh, just be a Christian. Names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we thank the Lord for that. Um, but I don't want to be just a pew warmer. I don't want to be a spectator in the Christian life. I, I want to get in there. And, and uh, if, if my following Jesus means sacrificing other things, number one, God is not going to be upset by that. And number two, he's going to take care of the things that I sacrifice. How many of us understand that have been a Christian for a long time, we may sacrifice some things in our life, but we also get to enjoy those things. I get to enjoy my family. My family's a blessing. 
but they also know in, in my life the things of God are very important to me and two things are not going to, the, to, going to clash to the point of never ever having anything to do with my family because number one I don't believe that's really what the Lord is saying here but he's saying you need to put me first and when I put Jesus first you know what's going to happen to my relationships they're going to be blessed Amen. they really are put it to the test and see what he says and then he says in verse 27 whosoever doth not bear his cross and we spoke a little bit about that this morning and come after me cannot be my disciple so if you're not willing to pick up the cross and sacrifice and deny self like we heard Jesus teach the morning if you're not willing to deny yourself your selfly pleasures of life you can't be a disciple you can be a Christian but not a disciple and uh, let me tell you how it works you go Christian disciple leadership all right so you look at the apostles for example they they believed in Jesus Christ they became his disciples and out of uh, out of the disciples that Jesus had he chose 12 apostles who were the leaders of the day with Jesus so if we want anything to do with spiritual leadership, you come through the ranks of being Christian, being a disciple, and then from the pool of disciples, Jesus chooses spiritual leaders to look after his things, all right? So if you have desires one day, uh, fellas, if you have desires of serving the Lord in a spiritual leader capacity, then let's see if you're a disciple first, because Jesus is not going to choose someone who is just a a, a nominal Christian instead of following him wholeheartedly and uh, you know going forward for Jesus now what he does say he now brings in two earthly illustrations one is someone who's going to build a house or build a building verse 28 which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he has sufficient so he's saying this he's saying Okay, if you're going to build a tower, you're going to sit down and count the cost of whether you're able to finish it. And that's in the same context of being a disciple. Before you launch out and say, yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I want to do whatever you want me to do. You need to sit down first and count the cost to see whether you are able to finish that. All right. And if you say, and you're honest before the Lord, you say, Lord, I really can't. I'm sure he would rather your honesty then launch out and try and be a disciple and try and do something and then fail and fizzle and get burnt out and hurt in the ministry. Amen. So he uses this illustration of building a tower. He says, I want you to count the cost. Now, it flows on with the same thought of counting the cost when he says this in verse number 31. Or what king goeth to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he hath able or sorry whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000 or else while the other is yet a great way off he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace so Jesus is now trying to get his uh, the multitude that are thronging him He's trying to get them to think about the cost of discipleship and he uses the building of a tower. Now he uses the illustration of a king going out to make war. And before a king goes out to make war, Jesus is saying, this king is going to sit down first and consult whether he's able with 10,000 soldiers to defeat the king that's coming that has 20,000 soldiers. And he's going to think to himself, well, let me see. I'm not going to be able to defeat that army of 20,000 with 10,000. So what he does is he sends an ambassage or a, or a group of people desiring peace. All right. So the thought behind that, as we look at this, is choosing your battles wisely. Choosing your battles wisely. And uh, I want you to hold your place there in Luke 14. And I want you to go to the book of Acts chapter 14. And uh, the reason why I say that is because when you think about fighting, now we as, um, as independent Baptists have always been known as the fighting fundamentalists. All right? we, we, like to, we like a stouch. All right? we, don't, we don't mind putting on the gloves and having a box, you know what I mean? It's like we will fight for anything. Uh, we will fight against false religion, we'll fight against um, Bible corruptions, we'll fight against liberalism, we'll fight against this, 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 this. And some of those things, really, for me, I don't have to sit down and consult about choosing the battle to go out and fight. If you're going to have a false Bible, 
that teaches a false doctrine, then I'll fight you on that. All right. But at the same token, there are things in the Christian life that you need to choose wisely and think, is it worth me getting in this fight? Is it worth me picking up arms and going into the battle? Especially when it comes to husbands and wives and families. Is it worth getting involved in this? Or do you think we need to broker some peace here? Now I want you to have a look at Acts chapter 14. And I want you to look at, um, let me see, verse number 4. So Paul and Barnabas are on their first missionary journey and it says this, But the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them. This is Paul and Silas. Look what the, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia unto the region that lieth round about. They heard that there was going to be an assault. They heard that there was going to be conflict. They heard there was going to be a battle and they fled. They just took off. All right. They didn't take a stand and fight. And the thought is this, is that sometimes it's better to run than to stand and fight. Sometimes it's better to run. There, there are some fights in our life when it comes to family members that we're better off just turning around the other way and running the other way. Now we think about that as Christians and we think that's a coward act to turn around and run because we want to front up to the battle and we want to give them what for. But in Paul's case here, they just turned and fled. We're not gonna. We're not gonna get into that. We're not gonna. We're not gonna fight that. Guess what? Because if we did, they want to stone us. I'm sure they would overpower us, overrun us. So they turned and they ran. Now, my nature to me, like I said, that's like gutless wonders. You know what I mean? But sometimes it's all right to be a gutless wonder. All right. That's the whole idea of choosing your battles wisely, making sure. That uh, you're going to come out of that battle with not too many scars, all right? So whether we're talking about literal fighting, whether we're talking about relational, or whether we're talking husbands and wives and families, all right? There's just some fights you don't need to get involved in. I've come to the point in my life, I was sharing a little bit, went around and, and visited with the hills there. Chris was in bed. Uh, I thought he might have got out of bed, but anyway, he was in bed. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we're just, we're just chatting away and in my younger years, you probably were the same, when I first got saved, mate, you, you, the, some things were like waving a red rag to a bull, you know what I mean? It's like, mate, I'm going in for it and, and man, I would go to school with guns blazing and, and uh, you know, the gospel and this and that and at home and, you know, I'd be like all over the place. And then when God called me into the ministry, it's like, yeah, man, I remember getting up and, and just really just preaching. I had zeal. But no knowledge. You know what I mean? You just get up there and I pity the people that I preach to. They put up with a lot. You know what I mean? But that's that's youth. That's youth. Now the older you get, Lord willing, the wiser you become. All right? The wiser you become. There's just some fights you don't need to get involved with. So look at this thing. Look at this passage with me. So we're, we're number one, we're counting the cost. Because there is a cost that you're going to pay... When you end up in a fight. There's a cost that you're going to pay. Number two. We see here that the king consulteth. Now when you look at any great wars. The president or the prime minister. A prime minister would have a war cabinet. That he would consult with. And the president of America. He had the joint chiefs of staff. Now the joint chiefs of staff. Were the heads of the marines. The army. The navy. The air force. Um, the defence secretary. So the president would have all these men and he would consult with these men and say, should we go into battle or should we not go into battle? And I love war history. It's probably one of the most exciting for me. And you might think, that's boring. I love war history. I like to look back and, and look at World War I, World War II, Korean War, um, Boer War and Vietnam War and the Gulf War. And uh, um, who remembers the war in the Falklands? Anyone remember the Falklands War there with England and, and over there? And uh, now you've got the war in Iraq and all of that. War history is, is interesting when you study it out. 
So the president would have, would have his joint chiefs of staff that he would consult with. And, and what Jesus is saying is before you enter into any fight, you better consult somebody. Consult somebody. Just because it's family, it doesn't matter. You consult somebody. Should I do this? Should I get involved in this? Such and such is doing this. And, and, and what do you think about that? There, you, you're not going to go wrong by asking some counsel. Right? The Bible says that in the multitude of counsellors, there is what? Safety. Safety. So we consider or we count the cost. We consult because there's a conflict on the way. How many of us right now can think about some conflicts that we've been involved in? Personal conflicts, family conflicts, business conflicts, <coughs> conflicts with the boss, conflict with, uh, with, with uh, children and family and so on and so forth. So we have to be very careful that we choose the battles wisely. Back in the day, when you talk about all the false religions, and I, I've not backed off on this, but you know what? There's, there's, there's bigger fish to fry than always fighting with the Charismatics or the Pentecostals. There's, there's bigger things to do than always fighting with the Church of Christ or whatever. And the bigger thing is this. It's the souls of men and women. I don't want to get bogged down in fighting with, with the other religious crowd because while I'm fighting them, we're not out winning the lost. All right. Now we could go to books like Nehemiah. Remember when Nehemiah was on the wall and they tried to get him to come down from off the wall and come and weep with it. And he said, if I come down off the wall, it's not going to finish. What's going to happen? So while the devil wants to throw out all these smoke screens and smoke bombs and get us all looking over here and fighting with the charismatics and all oh, you tongue talkers. And I'm not for that, by the way, and I've done my fair share of preaching against it, but I don't need to be fighting with that anymore because while I'm fighting over here, people are lost and dying and going to hell over here. So it's more important to be worrying about those who are lost than what it is with brethren. All right. Now, I want you to look at a few verses and then I'm going to give you some thoughts. I want you to turn to the book of Proverbs and I want you to have a look at Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs 17. <clears throat> I, I, like others, uh, pastors have, uh, and Tracy and I will often be with me when we do this, when we do marriage counselling. All right. Mm -hmm. A lot of marriages would not go south or not end up separation and wouldn't end in divorce. And I'm talking about Christian marriages now. If Christians would look at the Bible and do what the Bible says. Amen. Honestly, the, there's a verse that said, only by pride cometh what? Amen. Contention. Contention. Why? Because I want to win. I, I don't play to lose. When I was boxing, and I think you did boxing too it, it, back in the day, but when I, when I was boxing and I got into the ring, I wasn't going down. I, I'm not going down. I'm going to knock you out. I'm going to, I'm going to, those teeth, see you later. You know what I mean? <laughs> but now listen, having that type of attitude only by pride, there are times where I've kissed the dust. You know what I mean? And like, we, we had a guy in our church, remember Jim? Jim Walker, he was, a, he was a South Australian lightweight champion in boxing and he took us young fellas in church under his wings every, I think it was Tuesday night, we'd go to his place and we'd lift weights and we'd, we'd do all sorts. You remember, teenagers, man, 15, 16, think about all these teenagers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we've got muscles the size of knots in cotton, you know what I mean? But we thought, man, they were huge. Like, Look at that. And we'd be all pumped up and on would come the gloves. And he would take every one of us on three round, uh, three minute bouts. Uh, and we would do three rounds with him. And he loved it. He said he wants to keep fit. And it's like, yeah, bring it on, man. We put the gloves on. We would just lift and wait. We feel pumped. And uh, we would get in there. We would, you know, duck and weave and do all sorts of stuff. And, and uh, some of my mates would poof, poof, down we'd go. And, and one day I got in the ring with him and and he come in, and I thought I was so good. And I come up with a, was it? Yeah, I'll leave it. I come up with a, with a, with a right jab, and I just spread his nose. No, like that, and blood was everywhere. And it's like, and he went over into the corner. I'm, I'm over there. I'm standing in the corner, just you know, you're all right there, right, brother Jim. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're all right. Anyway, wipes, broke his nose. Wiped his, wiped his nose. 
And uh, ding, ding, he comes out, and I'm coming out here yeah, like this. Well, I didn't see the, you know, I didn't see what was coming. And it's like, bang, bang, bang. And I'm like, the next thing I see was the concrete. It's like, what am I doing down here? And I tell you. I tell you. So, you know, you've got to be careful. Choose your battles wisely. All right? Choose the battles wisely. And listen, couples wouldn't end up in so much trouble if they would learn just to walk away. Just walk away. Proverbs 17, look at this verse, verse number one. Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Yes. A house full of sacrifices with strife. You know what, that's, what, I, what that says to me? Man, you, can, you can be a, a, a Christian home and, and you can be at home uh, and, you can, and you can have those sacrifices which, which speaks of a spiritual act and, and all of that. But you know what? You can have all those house full of spiritual acts or sacrifices with strife and it doesn't go together. It doesn't work together. How can on one hand you be worshipping and praising God and, and thanking God at home and then the next thing you're fighting and fussing with the family? Doesn't work. Better is a dry morsel, a, a dry biscuit and quietness therewith. You're better off sitting at the table with a sayo biscuit with no butter, no Vegemite and a glass of water. That's a lot better than being in a Christian home, so called praising God and then fighting with your brothers and sisters or your husbands and your wives. All right, let's have a look at another verse. Go to Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21. <clears throat> Who better to talk about marriage relationships than Solomon? <laughs> we could go to verses like it's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than in a white house with a brawling woman Amen. Amen. <laughs> Solomon knew what it was all about I tell you Proverbs 21 look at verse number 23 whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles where do most fights begin Huh? Say something sarcastic, bit of a dig, you know? Say something in passing. And how, how many of us know also that, um, you know, you have a fight with your, your husband or your wife or with your children and um, you, you, you come back together, you forgive one another, you, you, you hug each other and that, and then the next fight you have, you bring up. You know, so if we would learn to keep our mouth, that is to guard what we say, we're going to keep our soul from troubles. Amen. Amen. All right. Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26. I don't know whether this is a shouting kind of uh, message or, or whatever, but uh, if you're not shouting, that means you're listening. Praise the Lord. Look at this. Proverbs 26. Look at verse number 20. Where no wood is, the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. So what that is saying is that stop adding fuel to the fire. Stop adding fuel to the fire. Stop, uh, stop throwing on the wood. You've kindled something now. You've got something going. And more often than not, once something is going, here's a bit of, here's a bit of petrol. <laughs> and here's some wood. And here's some coals. And it's just, it's just roaring and raging. The strife. Is that the sort of household we want? No. no we don't want households like that. So where, where no wood is, the fire goeth out. So if you stop adding fuel to the fire, guess what's going to happen? It'll burn out. It'll just, you know. So don't keep niggling. Don't keep using that mouth and adding more fuel to the fire. Be very careful about that. Now, let's go back to uh, Luke. Gospel of Luke. And I just want to give you a few things. Give you some marriage guidance counselling tonight. <laughs> All right. Now, if you're taking notes or if you're writing anything down, I want you to write this down. Number one, there are always casualties in war. There are always casualties in war. 
I did some research because I like war history and I want you to listen to the casualties now. World War I. Who can remember World War I? Who's old enough? To... <laughs> now listen to this. In World War I, there was 40 million casualties, including 10 million civilians. World War II, more than 80 million casualties, including 55 million civilians. The Vietnam War. And I'll be honest with you, the war intrigues me. I can still remember as a young boy the black and white pictures on the TV in the early 70s. I can still remember that. And it was a political war, it, you know, regardless of... The soldiers were not the ones at fault. They were doing what their government was asking them to do, yet they copped a lot of flack. But listen to this. In the Vietnam War, there was 1,118,000 casualties including 627,000 civilians. That's a lot. That is a lot. There are always casualties in war. And when Jesus said about counting the cost, and we know he's talking about discipleship, but we're learning about choosing battles wisely because you need to consult, you need to count the cost, because if you're going to enter into a battle... With a family member, with a wife, with a husband, with children, adult children, teenage children. You need to understand is if I'm going to enter into this conflict, casualties are going to be there. Casualties are there. There are always casualties. In marriages, it's always the children that are the casualties. Always the children. In churches, there's casualties between brethren and pastors. I want you to listen to this. Now, this is an American statistic, so you've got to be careful about statistics. But listen to this. Over 3,500 people leave churches a day in America. 3,500 people a day leave church. Over 1,500 pastors leave the ministry every month in 2017. Casualties. Is that America? In America, that's in America. Now we understand America's got a lot more churches than what Australia's got. Um, so, but when you think about that, that's a lot. But that tells you much how many joined, though, does it? Oh well, it does. But we're looking at casualties. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking at they had a number of churches were started, and that's good. But when you think about when you think about casualties in war, because how many of us understand that been in church long enough that there's that there's been fights between the brethren and pastors? between brethren and brethren, you know, like the Hadfields and the McCoys, you know, the church that we took over in, in Perth, it was exactly that, the Hadfields and the McCoys. It was one, and, and people that have been in that church for 20 years had been at each other. It was like one group would sit over here, another group would sit over there, and, and it was just all the time niggling and on and on and on and on, fights and fights. The pastor was involved and, and uh, people took sides. And all, Listen, nothing ever good comes from conflict. There's casualties when it comes to war. Secondly, secondly, I want you to write this down. You may win a fight, but lose the battle. You may win a fight, but lose the battle. And uh, you know it's alright to go into a fight. And uh, pick a fight or get into a fight. But you know what when you, when you win a fight but lose the battle. Then it's a hollow victory. Really it is. You know so what if you got the upper hand over your wife. Or you got the upper hand over your husband. Or you got the upper hand over a wayward adult child. Or, or, uh, or an aunt or an uncle or a brother. Or so what? So what? Jesus always wants reconciliation. Always reconciliation. So you may win a fight, but you may lose the battle. Thirdly, I want you to write this down. Wisdom says walk away. Pride says push on. Wisdom says walk away. It is wise, right, to consult. That's wisdom. Should I go into this? Now, let me just say this. Uh, pastors, uh, I've said this before, pastors, we're not perfect, but God has allowed us to be in a position 
that is an amazing position. It's, it's, a, it's a great position. I, it, you know, I would rather be a pastor or a preacher than anything else. You know, I tried going back truck driving and stuff like that during the week and so God said, no, nah, I want you to do that. All right? I would rather be a pastor than anything else. Most people that are struggling in relationships never go and consult the pastor. Pastor, what do you think? And more often than not, men, we're the ones that don't want to do it. If you value your relationship, if you value a relationship, you both husband and wife or parents and children would want to seek spiritual consultation. Now, Pastor Marsh and myself and other pastors and and. and Men of God, Brother John is a, is an older man of God. I, I'm sure, Brother John, is saying we would guarantee you that the counsel that you receive will be straight from here, Amen. straight from here. Because I'm not listen. Worldly counsel is nothing. But if you're not willing to apply the book, then nothing's going to turn around in a relationship. Seen it time and time again. So. Wisdom says walk away from a fight or wisdom will say you need to get some counsel on that. Pride says no, I don't need it, I'll work it out and or pride will be, you know what, I, I'm not in the wrong here. I ought to, I, listen, I'm right and I'm going, to, I'm going to fight for my rights. Okay, uh, just watch the casualties. Just watch the casualties. Number four, brokering peace is the answer to any conflict. Brokering peace. Notice he sent an ambassage, all right, and desireth conditions of peace. Maturity would, would want that. Listen, who likes to fight? I mean, you know, I mean, I do, but... <laughs> I want to choose my battles. I, I don't want to be fighting with my wife all the time. I don't, I, you should win. Come on. Come on. I'll beat her hands down. I'll both hands tied oh, on my back. Try it. I don't want to be fighting with my adult kids. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I don't want to. I, you know? What are you rolling your eyes at? Come on, I'll take one. <laughs> Yes. Now, Carly and I, we have the same personality, alright? We have the same, so we talk about iron, iron doesn't necessarily sharpen iron here, but what happens is sparks always fall. <laughs> so we have the same personality that's just like... <clears throat> now, she's young and I'm older. And as an older, not just as a, as a dad, but as an older Christian, as a pastor, I should have the maturity to... <laughs> you ever when no wood is, the fire goes out? So if I hung around over here, right, and she's like, and I, you know what I mean? Then it's going backwards and forwards, it's like a boxer. But if I just turn around and walked away, she's going to look pretty stupid arguing with herself. <laughs> so that's where it stops. Walk away. Now she may follow. And guess where I'm going? I'm going to my bedroom. Shut the door. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll share something with you. Many, many years ago, when Tracy and I were, well, we hadn't been married that long. We were mucking around, right? We were mucking around. And uh, <laughs> I had a belt, right? And I, I was flicking at it, right? Flicking and trying to get it. She says, you hit me, you look out. And we were mucking around, so it wasn't. I was flicking it, and I got too close, and I cracked her with the belt. And I, you could hear it sting. And she flew off the bed and I flew out of that room and I, <laughs> I ran into the toilet and I shut the door and that was it. <laughs> that's it. I'm not getting into this fight, you know what I mean? Walk away, that's what I'm saying. Just walk away, just walk away. Now, I want you to go to the book of Genesis. All right, Genesis, we're going to finish with this. We're going to finish with a scriptural illustration. You remember Jacob and Esau? You talk about sibling rivalry. You talk about conflict in the home. 
Jacob and Esau were it. We won't go through the whole thing. You remember the birthright and the, uh, and the blessing. All right. Jacob got both. Esau was angry. And from that time on, Esau was like, I'm going to kill you. His own brother. I'm going to kill you. That's a conflict right there. Now look at this. So we're talking about brokering peace. All right. Look at chapter 32, verse 1. And Jacob went on his way. And the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is the God of hosts. And he called the name of the place Mahanaim. Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, and unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. All right. So Esau is the leader of the Edomites. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants. And I have sent to tell my lord that I, that I may find grace in thy sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, we came to thy brother Esau, and he also, and he also, he cometh to meet thee with 400 men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and divided the people that was with him and the flocks and herds and the angels into two bands. Now, I want you to go on down to verse number 21. So, and anyway, Jacob, Jacob has uh, sent over um, all these presents, all right? So he sent before him. Uh, he's verse 14. He sent 200 she goats, 20 he goats, 200 ewes, and all these. And he sent these presents over. So he went the presents over before him and himself lodged that night in the company, right? And uh, look at verse uh, chapter 33. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him four hundred men, and he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, who are these with thee? And he said, the children which God hath graciously given thy servant. So what happened? Well, Jacob brokered a peace deal. Jacob sent gifts to Esau. Now, it was God's will for Jacob to have the blessing and the birthright. But it caused a rift in the family. So Jacob, all right, took the upper road, the upper, you know, and he said, let's send over some gifts. Let's send a present. And let's try and be a blessing to Esau. I think the Bible says something like that in Proverbs 21, 14, where a gift in secret pacifieth anger. So always want to broker a peace deal. All right. And lead the way in that. Lead the way in that. Don't listen. Let me just say this. As a husband and wife, men, if we're waiting for our wives to do it, don't wait for them to do it. You do it. Right? Or vice versa. Ladies, don't, don't always wait. You, you begin the process. You broker the peace. And even with kids, it's like, why are we always waiting for the other person to make the first move? Now, let me share this with you and we'll close. Many of you, some of you, I guess, know that um, when we first moved back to the Sunshine Coast to start Heritage Baptist Church, uh, the pastor of Sunshine Baptist Church wasn't happy with that. And uh, we got together with our initial meeting and uh, things were said and things were done and, and uh, it was just, it was, a, it was a fight. It was just two when we come together and we fought, right? And that, that's been like that for two years, about two years. Well, God had put it on my heart at the beginning of this year to go and meet with him and make things right. And so at the conference, conference is good for a number of things. Most people's heart are really soft in a conference because the spirit of God is moving. And so God had spoken to my heart. The brother was there and God said, you need to go and talk to him. So I went over to him and I said, look, let's get together and have a coffee and let's get this sorted out. He said, I'd like to do that. So I come home and uh, I, I said that to, to, you know, wife and kids and, and 
Oh, it was before or after, but I remember one of the kids saying, Dad, why do you have to do that? You didn't do anything wrong. You did, why are you going to you know, initiate this, uh, this meeting? And I said, because it's the right thing to do. So we got together, we prayed about it for the week. We were meeting on the Friday, so I'd spent all week praying about it. We got together, we sat down, we shook hands, we had some chats, and then we got into it. And what the outcome of was is that I apologised to him for my attitude and for bringing certain people into the conversation and he also likewise apologised on his behalf. So there was reconciliation there. There was a peace deal made. Why is that? Because I want to choose wisely my fights. I don't want to be always fighting the brethren. I don't want to always be fighting family. I don't want to always be fighting. Choose the fights wisely. There's, there's, there's bigger and greater fights for a Christian than to be fighting one another. All right? Better fights. All right? Fighting for the souls of men and women. So the washout of that meeting was all good. All good. Pardon me? Whereabouts was that sunshine? Sunshine, whereabouts is the church in Caloundra? All right. No, I just wondered because Sunshine Yeah, yeah, this is Sunshine Baptist Church. So all good. So I just want to let you know that we had the meeting and everything's good. But it's important to make sure that you lead the way in bringing that peace. All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Uh, Lord, I pray that it's been somewhat of a help tonight as we have looked at. Uh, you know, choosing wisely the battles. And Lord, most of all, that I just can't help but uh, keep thinking about the, the casualties that come as about uh, as reason for conflict. And so, Lord, I pray that, uh, God, you'd help us with that. Bless the remainder of the evening. Bless the fellowship time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right.